much. I'm, I'm so, so um, 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 grateful and, um, and excited about this invitation. This will be my first time lecturing in Ontario. I've been lecturing a couple of times in Prince Edward Island of some reasons, but now in this uh, province. And it's, I'm also mindful, two of my fatherly friends made their last journeys in life to St. Catherine's and to the seminary before they, they passed away. Uh, um, the, the late uh, blessed Dr. Uh, Robert Preuss and, and Dr. Tom J. I. A. Hart. So I understand there is something to, to be found here that is important for your, for, for, for your preparation for etern life eternal. Um, you will find in my, on, uh, my PD presentation here a lot of titles, but that will be, I will take you away from, from focusing on that by, by all these mispronunciations that I will also <laughs> serve you with here and add to the range of, of, of queer accents that you already have put out up with during this conference. Um, now, the, 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 this, uh, my presentation has as its, as its mm, um, presupposition a situation living in a very secularized uh, context where, where you need to, to find a way to communicate with the outer world, so to say, and to, to, to secular population, also survive uh, as institutions. So you have, have to have that in mind. I will start far out in the outskirts uh, in the world before we, we, we come close and, uh, to, to Martin Luther, but don't, don't give up, we will come there eventually. Yeah, th this, you, uh, perhaps you've seen this kind of, of a map. This is the latest report of the uh, uh, World View um, report, uh, pointing out here uh, these two, two uh, coordinates, survival values, uh, um, and on the other end, self-expression values, where you would find in the English-speaking world, Canada as the extreme uh, in terms of self-expression values, and Sweden uh, in the Protestant Europe here. And you see Sweden also exalted here because we are having come far in terms of secular rational values. You are a bit behind there. I think it's due to Montreal and Newfoundland. But you see, you will, don't give up, you don't give up, you will, you will get there. Um, and, and how do you define self-expression values? Um, it's a, you can see a specific subset of self-expression values, emancipative values, combines an emphasis on freedom of choice and equality of opportunities. Emancipative values thus involve priorities of lifestyle, liberty, gender equality, personal autonomy, autonomy, and the voice of the people. Emancipative values constitute the key culture component, uh, component of a broader process of human empowerment. And of course, having these values high up in, in, in your conscience will, uh, will cause in you a challenge in relationship to, to authority. Uh, especially traditional authorities as church, family, historical values. And what we will, will meet in our countries and in the whole Western world today is the crisis of authority. We go further into this. Um, and, and here actually there is a kind of interaction between Sweden and Canada uh, that we are, we are similarly dominant of values of self-expression. When Swedish primary schools uh, in the 1990s took further steps away from the authority of teachers saying, we are not going to teach the pupils anything more, we are going to coach them how to become scholars themselves and to do their own uh, investigations when they are eight or nine years old. The inspiration came from the University of Manitoba where there had been, for a long time, a frustration of having their students to study the British history. Why not the French or, 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 or the Aboriginal history? And therefore they gave up, as I have been told, that kind of, of curriculum 
so instead they, they, they gave them methods how to study whatever history they wanted. And, and Swedish politicians thought that was terrific. So they took that method from the University of Man Manitoba and put it into our primary school among six years and seven old years. So we have something there in, 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 in common. So conclusion, authority, even in historical matters, may be an issue in Canada as well as in Sweden. And I have heard rumors there are some issues on that even in the United States nowadays with a, with a snowflake phenomena uh, among the, the, the college students and, and uh, 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 the president of the United States whose authority sometimes is questioned. Anyway, <clears throat> authority has for a long time and, and in increasingly so been understood in an historical materialistic way, in, in a Marxist way. And, and, and I mind you, this is not a, a Marxism in, in, in sense of a political party. It is the, the, the kind of Marxism that, that is totally accepted in the scholarly academical world. And, and to, to simplify that understanding is that supremacy is suppressing subjects. So all kinds of, of authority is something bad and suppress, suppressive and would limit the presupposition to develop as a full and authentic human being. So the, the basic calling for, for all people and for all suppressed groups is to unite, of course, and get rid of th these kinds of authorities. So, but my, what, what I want to share with you here is, is um, another understanding of authority which I have found so rewarding and so fruitful to come to know. The background is the, the, the refugee situation in Europe after the Second World War, where the Red Cross um, took help from a British uh, psycholo um, psychologist, John Bowlby, who, to study what would, what, how did it impact children to be, um, to, to lose contact with their parents when they were, you know, in the run what would happen with, with them, and, 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 and how decisive, decisive is the relationship between child and parents. And, and well, he came to the conclusion that this is an extremely uh, decisive relationship, and, and actually in that relation between parents and children are the presupposition for, for psychological growth and maturity. His um, uh, disciple, uh, Mary Ainsworth, who actually studied at the University of Toronto and, and, and kept on his, uh, in, um, his, his uh, scholarly work, she constructed a very famous kind of experiment, the, the stranger in the room experiment, where a mother with her, her sh child, a baby at the age of around 12 months, sitting in, in her lap, in a room with, with also some toys uh, in the floor. And you could see in the cameras when they are observed that the child soon would want to get down from her lap and, 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 and investigate the room and, and play with, with the <coughs> toys there. And then a stranger would open the door and come into the room. And how does the child then behave? Well, in 60%, would the child crawl back to the mother and want to be lifted up in her lap again? And those would be the children who has a safe attachment to their mothers, who expect safetyness, closeness um, uh, with the mother. 20% um, would, wouldn't do anything, just keep on playing and doing what they do. And these would be children who has um, a, 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 a negative attachment, who doesn't expect any safeness from the mother. And other 20%, they, they would be puzzled and not know what, what to do. So they would have a, an ambivalent kind of profile on their attachment. <clears throat> now, this um, psychology of attachment, which is a branch of psychology of development, has been further investigated by, by um, uh, Dr. Gordon Neufeld from Vancouver. 
uh, who has been such a blessing for our school and, and, um, and become very um, sort of um, popular among pedagogues in Sweden. And even those who are rather radicals have, through him, come into a new way of thinking. He, he has his background working as a, consul, um, as a um, counselor in, in, in youth prisons in, in British Columbia um, already in the 1970s. And he, he discovered among the, those um, teenagers there that they have this strange combination of being sort of premature in terms of being very sort of um, self-secure and being cool. But that was combined with a, 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 a great extent of, of um, being um, infan infantile, can you say so? Yes. So uh, retarded in the psychological development. So 20 years later, he, later, he worked with a, with a middle class um, high school in, in Vancouver. And to, to his um, um, amazement and, and to his um, shock, he now saw the same kind of eyes, the same kind of, of attitude among these uh, um, young persons there in, in the middle class high school. So he started to, to, to look further into this. And, and his conclusion is that through all over the Western world, there is a psychological phenomena after the Second World War that he called peer attachment. There are strong powers, the marketing powers who want um, open-minded consumers who have constructed the idea of the teenagers. And also, the, of course, the, the leftists who want to destroy families to, to deprive youth from traditional values. This has caused uh, a situation where young children very early on attach to peers, to, 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 to their classmates, instead of to their parents. So, so, so they don't have that kind of authority anymore, and this is devastating for their psychological development. Because it is <clears throat> a conclusion of the psychology, psychology of attachment is that, that that kind of attachment need to be hierarchical. It is um, the relationship between a child being in what I myself define as an epsilon position, open and, and, and the arm stretching up to be lifted up, meeting a parent in an alpha position. The A is like, you know, two arms reaching down to take care, to lift. It's a warm-hearted leadership. And, and that need to be hierarchical. It needs to be clear who is in alpha and who is in an epsilon position. And what happened among peers is that they have to fight who should be in the alpha position because you can't attach in, in, in an equal level. And this causes bullying, mobbing, bullying comes from uh, the same age children fighting for, to, to take the alpha position. <clears throat> Attachment is like the umbilical cords of the psyche, and it develops uh, in, in, in the first six years in this order, according to Dr. Neufeld's uh, um, theories. The first year is um, the develop a, an attachment, even at, during pregnancy, of, of sensation, of, through the senses. The child would recognize the voice of the mother, or even of, of the father after birth. And it would re recognize the, 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 and, and feel safe with the, with the skin and the scent of the mother and so on. And, 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 and seeing the parents through the senses, there are deep bounds attached from the child to the parents. The second year will come with, with a strive for imitation. We change into what we love. So a child that is safely attached to its parents will start to imitate them by forming sounds. And this comes at the same time where the brain develops one million new synapses a second, which is a presupposition to learn languages. So 
the language comes by imitation. Imitation comes through attachment. The third year comes a uh, longing uh, to be special, to, 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 um, to say to, to your siblings, this is my mummy. You can't be in her lap. I kick you in the face. Uh, and, and, and this is my daddy, and he's stronger than your daddy, and so on, because he's much older, and, and so on. And the fourth, fourth year comes a sensibility from the child to, to hear words of confirming its significance by the parents. You are daddy's princess. You are mommy's little prince, and, and you are so special. And, and these words are so important for building uh, strengthen the, the, uh, these umbilic cords, these attachments. Um, uh, during the fifth year, um, a, a sound attachment will, will um, express itself by uh, the child uh, sharing its secrets with the parents. You can tell from a five-year-old who it, it is attached to. If it whispers its secrets only to hear, then it's yet a fear attached already. But if it's sharing its secrets with the parents, it's all right. Then it's still at, um, parent attached. <clears throat> and um, the sixth year it comes with a further ability of, of, um, of um, <clears throat> having this attachment also when you are not in the presence of your parents that you that you remember in school. Well, I'm not going to do that because my Parents wouldn't like it. And even if those, uh, um, my peers are, are saying bad words to me, I know and remember I'm loved by my parents. These are, are very crucial things, and I can't go very much further into this. But hey, this is a, important quotations from this uh, wonderful book on Neufeld, uh, um, Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. You really should read that book. It's a really eye-opener. He writes here, quotation, peer orientation masquerades as natural or goes undetected because we have unwittingly become peer-oriented ourselves. For members of the post-war generations born in England, North America, and many other parts of the industrialized world, our own preoccupation with peers is blinding us to the seriousness of the problem. Culture, until recently, was always handed down vertically from generation to generation. For millennia, uh, wrote Joseph Campbell, the youth have been educated and the aged rendered wise through the study, experience, and understanding of traditional cultural forms. Adults played a, a critical role in the transmission of culture, taking what they received from their own parents and passing it down to their children. However, the culture our children are being introduced to is much more likely to be the culture of, the peer, of their peers and that, uh, than that of their parents. And I would add to that, in Sweden anyway, being a Sweden, a modern country, what is happening is that the parents are learning new fashions from their teenagers. They want to be peers to their children. So, 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 so the, the, the handing on of tradition is going backwards. Now, according to the psychology of, psychology of attachment, the relationship to a senior person, because this is not biological defined, it also works in other kind of relationship, um, to a senior person in an alpha position is the best presupposition for growth and maturity. It, it, it works like you, you are behind a windshield having some senior person taking responsibility that helps you and lets you being uh, sort of careless and playful and creative. I remember as long I, as I was a curate, I found out, I, and, 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 and in, well, I, I come up with new stories to tell my children at bedtime every night. But when I became at the year, uh, age of 30, senior pastor myself, my, um, um, my fantasy 
was uh, diminished. I couldn't have that creativity anymore. I had found that the, the dean I worked under in the cathedral, that he was, you know, a bit of a, you know, petrified kind of an old timer. But afterwards I understood he being perhaps someone who not always accepted my splendid new ideas, but he took responsibility. And therefore, I was free to have my imagination and my creativity. This is just to point out that the, uh, there is a, another kind of authority that is totally different from the Marxist way of thinking, where authority is a presupposition for growth and life. Here, I have, uh, I have constructed the image of the Ypsilon person, a child, rooted in this sixth kind of attachment that I pointed out before in the heart of the parent. And the deeper the child is rooted within the parent, the further away from the parent it can develop in these three basic psychological processes. In the emerging process, that is, I want to take part of life. I will I want to realize my dreams. I want to discover what is around me as the child from experiment discovered the room and playing with the tools, the toys, and the toys, sorry. And the other um, process, the adaptive process, that is a process where you meet others and take in their ideas, and instead of thinking black and white, you will have all these kind of nuances, and you would, you would come in a state where you have mixed feelings. Dr. Neufeld told me about his 15 years old son who said to his father, Father, I am getting mentally ill. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me all about it, he said, excited. Well, you see, I have decided here to do my homeworks. And then there is a voice within me saying, no, I want to go to the cinemas. And then another voice again, no, you should sit at home, do home books. Oh, Dr. Neufeld said, I congratulate my, you, my son. You are getting a job because you have mixed feelings. That is a, a sure sign of psychological maturity. Those fighting in, in, in IS, the, ter the jihadists and the terrorists, they are, they are young people who has defective attachment, who wouldn't have come long in the adaptive process. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and, and um, in the adaptive process is also this uh, process of, 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 of adjusting to, to others and, 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 and not only doing it your own way, but, um, but uh, being able to do social um, ad adoption. Actually, I think I, I mixed it. what I talked about first was the integrative process, and now I mentioned the adaptive process. Anyway, here is, is a, 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 a 16th century or early 17th century painting of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the, 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 the Virgin of the And here is a wonderful image of, of, of uh, the psychology of attachment. Christ is sitting in his mother's lap. He's safe there un, in her lap and under her veil. But now from that position, he is curious. He's discovering the world around and wants to investigate it. He, the, the emergent process says to him, you are allowed to take from the grapes of life. You can look out to it with some interest. So, so this really is a wonderful illustration of, of what, what I try to, to uh, to um, relate to here from, from Dr. Neufeld. So, to, to conclude this, um, you could see in, in, in the structure of authority different positions. What I spoke about was the alpha position. I define it like this. It's, the, it's a warm-hearted leadership, an authority. And what kind of authority is it? The alpha has integrity and a structure. If you see to the letter A here, it's like a triangle on the top there with integrity. 
but the Alpha also reaches down and lifts up and, and liberates and comforts. Um, the Alpha is like it's satisfied. It has enough in itself and doesn't need to take from others. The Alpha is the realization of agape, the outgiving love that we meet in, 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 in the New Testament. Now I'm going to slander another letter, the letter B. I have grown more and more suspicious of the B or the beta. Of course, this is just a symbol for you in, in a pedagogic way. But if you look on the beta, this is not reaching the upper position. It's almost being there, but not quite reaching it. You know, we have many, kind, many examples of leaders like that, that never completely reached the alpha position, but had to go with the beta position. So the beta, that's the kind of authority that we would expect to meet in the fallen world. That's the leadership of Eros. That's the love that wants to have, that is attracted, that is coveting. That is something we often see among leaders. And of course, that's the background also of the Marxist reaction against authority that has been misused throughout history. <clears throat> so the, the beta kind of leader demands instead of gives, it's also the idol of what I would call a hungry god. We have all these idols, all these gods, uh, true religions, where that needs offerings, that are hungry, that needs to be served by men. <clears throat> and if you can see the, the pattern of the beta, all the movements are back into itself. It, it, it goes out from itself when it's going to do something, it has its starting points, its, its resources in itself, but it goes back. So, so it's a good symbol for what Luther called in curvatus in si, in curved in oneself. Now, the third possible um, position here in the play or the structure of authority is what I come up with the idea to call the Ypsilon position. And how is that defined? The attitude of an Ypsilon person is a person in need who does not hope in himself. That is a person who accepts his needs or her needs and, 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 and are, are ready to, 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 to uh, sort of uh, um, uh, um, um, show that to others. <clears throat> An Ypsilon person is a person opening up for the Alpha in invocation and in prayer. And, and here, I actually did this presentation before the paper yesterday by Dr. Schoene. So I, I would, as a good example of this, uh, is it? A, oh, I haven't, sorry. This is really bad. <laughs> there we are. Wir uh, sind alle Betten, das ist wahr. This is really a wonderful expression of being in an Ypsilon position. So, but an, an Ypsilon person is also a person who is ready to, to obey and to give praise and thanks and lift up the hand like, a, like an Ypsilon or a vial. <clears throat> so you, you could have here this, uh, this, I would call the pattern of authority according to creation and of, of salvation. God in an alpha position, man in an ypsilon position, obeying and, and coming with all the needs in prayer and invocation and also in praising and thanksgiving. And in this relationship to God, man could, towards other human beings in alpha position, come also in an ypsilon position, towards your parents, towards your, your, the supremacies of, of the church or, or of the world. But you can also... Uh, by your relationship to God, pose yourself in an alpha position towards those who are in need, your children and your parishioners, your students or, and, and all your neighbors who are in need. So you can meet them not as a hungry beta, but, but as a self-giving alpha. Um, so what, what we can see how it described in the fall in, in, in Genesis, you would, you would um, 
find a situation where Adam and Eve got the impression from, from, from the snake that God is not in Alpha, that, that is totally generous. He, he, is, uh, he is only a beta that denies them from eating from all the trees, you know. And, and, and you will find that the nature that should be uh, subjected to human beings is in uproar. And, 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 and that there will be all these kinds of conflicts. Of course, I, I'm not denying that also non-Christians as parents and children can still, of course, uh, work in an alpha epsilon relationship. So, now we are coming close to, to what I really was invited to do here. Our question, how now does Luther understand and exercise authority in his preaching? What can we learn from his Christmas sermons? I have used only two sermons, the Christmas Eve sermon and the Christmas, early Christmas morning service, uh, sermon in, in the um, Church Postilla, Kirchenpostilla from 1522. So, here's the Kutze Zusammenfassung. Uh, preaching with and proclamation, pro uh, preaching with and proclaiming the authority of the Word of God in law and gospel and exhibiting Christ in both Alpha and Epsilon positions, Luther, in service to the Holy Spirit, rhetorically dancing the dance of attachment. Um, and I just comment on dancing the dance of attachment. When, when I meet my grandchildren, I have nine grandchildren, and, and they live far away, and when, when we meet again after a month, I start off dancing the dance of attachment. That means that I look them in the eyes, I connect their eyes, I, I, I smile to them, and, 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 I, and I make them smile to me. And I just give them questions that, that they would uh, answer with, with a yes, nodding. Uh, and, 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 and by this, collect them again, and, 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 and causing this kind of good, attached relationship. But Luther, he do, does this, un, and he unmasks the hungry authorities of the false images of God as beta. We will look into this later on. He makes Christ, the Alpha, attachable for faith in the promises reached out as almost like a hand that you could grasp. And here I, will relate to, I want to relate to a wonderful little uh, uh, article in Logia by Philip Carey, um, who I don't know too much about. I think he's a professor of philosophy uh, at a reformed uh, college somewhere. But he wrote about the Lutheran codicil, where he compares uh, Luther's understanding of gospel to St. Augustine. And he points out that the unique with Luther is that he, that he speaks about uh, the, the gospel almost like a sacrament. It, when he says you should grasp, you should believe the gospel, it's like the sacrament being elevated, the host being elevated for faith to see and to grasp. And that's the point of attachment, I would say. But Luther also turns beta hearts into ypsilon hearts in relationship to God by preaching the, the law and the gospel. He turns ypsilon hearts into alpha hearts towards the neighbors in need and turns beta hearts into ypsilon hearts towards parents and those in statu parentis. Now we, we, I, I will try to prove this, uh, um, this um, thesis of mine by different samples from, from the sermons here. So, first, uh, some quotation that, that, that um, points out how Luther describes God in an alpha position, frustrated by a long story of the church depicting God in a beta position. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> finally, we must explain the song of the angels, which we use daily, daily in the Mass, glory in excelsis Deo. The first item is the honor of God. This is where one should begin, in order that in all things the glory and the honor be given to God. It is to him who does 
gives and has all things, so that nobody may attribute anything to himself or assume anything. For the honor is due nobody uh, to nobody except God alone. It cannot be shared with anybody or become common property. God as Alpha. Behold how richly God honors those who are despised and act to be despised of men. Here you see where his eyes are turned, into the depths and low places. He sits above the cherubim and looks into the depth of the abyss. So it's an alpha who reaches down for, for the lowly and, and, and not uh, obita, just despising them. How could God have demonstrated his goodness more powerfully than by stepping down so deep into flesh and blood that he does not despise that which is secret by nature, but honors nature. This, this is about the, 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 the pregnancy of Mary. But honors nature to the highest degree exactly where it was brought into shame to the highest degree in Adam and Eve. And further on, for the gospel teaches that Christ was born for our sake, just as the angel says here, I announce to you a great joy which will come to all people, for to you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. From these words you see clearly that he was born for us. He is outgiving. This is the great joy of which the angel speaks. This is the consolation and the superabundant goodness of God that man, if he has his faith, may boast such treasures as that Mary is his real mother, Christ his brother, and God his father. So I would point out for you that I mean that that, that kind of, of pattern of, of basic human life that Dr. Neufeld describes. We see here example how Luther uses the language of attachment, how, how, he, how he warmly speaks about the basic relationship of family, of mother and child, father and child, and siblings. <clears throat> there we are. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but going on <clears throat> to do this, um, Luther first also puts the word of God in an alpha position. He certainly underlines all through these Christmas services uh, where you could expect him only to speak about the, 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 the mystery of incarnation, but he also constantly underlines the authority of the word of God. The shepherds did and found what the angels had told them, the first and chief item is faith. If these shepherds had not believed to the angels, that they would not have gone to Bethlehem, nor would they have done any of the things which are related to them in the gospel. Luther illustrates here that it was the word of God that the angels spoke that caused the shepherds to go to Bethlehem. It was not only the vision of angels, but what the words they spoke. Luther illustrates how the authority of the word of God works with the shepherds attaching to the angels in an alpha, alpha position. But it's not that the position of the angels adds to the word of God, rather that the word of God give the angels their position. The authority of the word of God is absolute. Luther writes, according to this, for whoever does not accept the word on its own account, is never inclined to accept it on account of any preacher, even if all angels were preaching to him. And whoever accepts it on account of the preacher, he believes neither the word nor in God through word. <clears throat> believes um, the preacher and in the preacher. In such case, the faith does not last long if it's built on the authority of men. This is also the difference between godly faith and human faith. Human faith clings to a person. It believes, trusts, and honors 
the word on account of him who speaks it. But godly faith clings to the word, which is God himself. It believes, trusts, and honors the word, not on account of him who has spoken it, but feels that here is such certainty of truth that nobody can ever tear it away from it, even if the very same preacher should try it. <clears throat> so I've I, I gone to, to, to the German text here to, to, to point out that Luther really uses verbs that comes very close to the expression to attach. Uh, so, so he says, aber der gottlich glaubt wiederum haftet auf dem Wort. Also auf heften, I suppose, is the verb here. So, 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 so this, this is so close to the psychology of attachment to, to, to really cling to uh, em also emotionally. And it's interesting to see that Luther words use the word fühle it, sondern er fühle das so gewiss wahr ist. So it's, it's something intuitive, intuitive in this relationship. Yes, there we go. Um, <coughs> observe here that it is emotionally based acceptance of authority that creates rela relationship. In our inherent beta attitude, we will dis be disoriented in our attachment. In the light of the word of God, we can be put in the Ypsilon position of faith and attached so strongly to the truth of God that nobody can break that bond. Luther uses the term of, for attachment, haftet auf, in German, cling to in English. And this goes on further in, in the um, Christmas morning sermon. Again, all those who believe Christ on account of his person and his miracles deserted him when he was crucified. The word itself, disregarding the person, must, must satisfy the heart, must embrace and capture the man so that he, like one, should I try to learn? Um, <clears throat> for God at time tests his elect and pretends uh, to want something other than he previously indic indicated. The faith persists in both life and death, even as in hell and heaven, and nothing can overthrow it, for it rests on the word alone, without regard to any person. The angels are quickly forgotten, and only the word of God remains. All clung only to the word. God also arranged that there be described the faith that clings to the word and acquiesces in the word that expresses the action. For if Christ's life and suffering were not comprehended in the word to which faith might cling, they would have availed nothing for all those who were eyewitnesses, received no benefit from their experience, or only very little. Of course, Luther sees that in Christ's plan, he knows that there will come a long time, the time of the church, where Christ is not e immediately con uh, um, visible but he has appointed the word of God to be the point of attachment. Um, and this is especially, of course, in, in, the, in the gospel that, as I said before, um, Dr. Carey has, has described like, um, like a sacrament being, being distributed, like the elevated host that faith can... can uh, um, put its eyes on and, and grasp for. Now, Luther also um, points out how a Christian, by clinging to Christ and the word of God, could be um, equipped to be posed in an alpha position. Here, a quoting again. <clears throat> the fourth item is love of one's neighbor and renunciation of self. The shepherds demonstrate this by leaving their sheep and by proceeding not to the high and mighty lords in Jerusalem, not to the town councillors of Bethlehem, but to the lowly people in the stable. They present themselves to the lowly and are ready to serve and to do what ex was expected of them. Had they not had faith, they would not have left their sheep as they did. 
and they would not um, let their property lay around, especially as the angels had not commanded them to do so. For they did this out of their own free will, following their own counsel, as the text says. And further on, <clears throat> love operates in exactly the same manner. Love needs no command. It does everything of its own ac accord, does not tarry, but hurries and considers, its, considers, considers it sufficient that the direction is pointed out. Love does not need and will not tolerate someone to goad it along. I, I don't know if you have reflected on the uses of the law, the first and the second and the third law, use of the law. I would say this is a wonderful example from Luther how we should understand the fulfilling of the law among the disciples of Christ, that it doesn't come as on commandment, it comes as an imitation, like a child wants to imitate its parents and thus learn how to speak. So, so we will learn the, the language of love by loving Christ and accepting him in an alpha position, posing ourselves in the epsilon position, and thus we can pose ourselves uh, in an alpha position, a loving, self-giving position in relationship to those who need us. Thus, a Christ, Christian should move freely in love. A Christian should forget himself and that which is his. He should think only of his neighbor and be concerned about him. As St. Paul says in Ephesians 5, which is, is so wonderful when you read Luther's uh, sermons. He always uh, misquotes the, the scripture. The, the editors have always to correct the quotations. It's, it's the wrong verse, the wrong chapter, the wrong book. So this is actually from Philippians 2.4. Let no one consider what is his, but that which is the, the, the other's. So, so Luther wasn't a, an evangelical fundamentalist that really uh, thought that Bible verses is the most important thing to quote. Anyway, let each one bear the other's burden and thus fulfill the law of Christ. This is Galatians, of course. Now, uh, w when Luther is, is, is stern and strict in his Christian sermons, this is mostly directed toward a, a the church describing God, not as Alpha, but as this, this um, in, in a, what I call a beta position. And also those churchly authorities that is not in, uh, uh, um, that is not uh, um, 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 sort of mature in the leadership, but is, are selfish. Again, all those who believed Christ on account of his person and his miracles deserted him when he was crucified. That is the way it is now and what has always been. The word itself, disregarding the person, must, must satisfy the heart. No, I think, the, I think I misspelled that. The word should, no L there. The word itself, disregarding the person, must satisfy the heart must embrace the ca uh, and capture the man so that he, like one who is imprisoned in it, feels how true and right it is. Even if all the world, all the angels, all the princes of hell had a different message. Indeed, even if God himself had a different message. For God at times tests his elect and pretends to want something other than previously indicated as happened to Abraham when he was ordered to sacrifice his son Isaac. So this is Luther saying that sometimes God tries us by posing himself in a beta position. That would also be what Jesus does when he meets the Canaanite uh, uh, woman, the mother, who, who, who begs for, for the crumbs uh, from the table of the children. <clears throat> and further on, as the saying goes, each one likes his own ways best, and so the country with fools is blessed. This is uh, an old German uh, saying, I suppose. Experience teach, 
teach us how the, the religious orders, states, and the sects are divided among themselves. Each believe that his order, his estate, his way, his work, his undertaking is best and the right road to heaven, and looks down upon the others, taking no interest in them. We observe this nowadays among the priests, monks, bishops, and the entire clergy, that they act as if they are in this um, beta position which is not as the Alpha, loving those who are lowly and in needs, but despising them. Of course, we can apply this also on ourselves and not only point out medieval clergy, of course. No doubt, one also finds concord, peace and humility among murderers and public sinners, as also among those who put on a show of virtue. However, this is a unity of the flesh, not of the spirit, as when Pilate and Herod become united uh, with one another and practice peace and humility with one another. The Israelites did the same thing as Psalm 2 says, and this is actually Psalm 2. The kings and princes of this earth have become unites among themselves against Christ. In the same manner, too, the Pope, the monks, and the priests are united whenever they direct their activities against God, whereas at other times they are split in factions. Fractions. Well, but these days the Pope with his bishops and priests are filled, um, has filled the world with laws and restraints, and there is nothing in all the world but sheer compulsion and intimidation Voluntary orders or estates no longer exists in accordance with the prophecy that love would be extinguished and the word um, corrupted with the doctrines of men. So, so what is devastating here, understood out from the psychology, psychology of attachment, that is, if you have dysfunctional parents that are not posing themselves in an alpha position, being trustworthy, being re reliable, that would cause an ambivalent or dysfunctional attachment of the child that would cause it to, instead of, 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 of being sort of um, in this ipsilon position, uh, to try to be cool and strong within itself. And that coolness, that ice shield around the heart becomes soon a prison that limits the, the, matur the maturation uh, and the growth of the child's psyche. <clears throat> now, this was about Luther pointing out different ways of, of, of posing yourself in a beta position. Now he goes on preaching and in, in, in telling us about the Ypsilon position. <clears throat> the shepherds acknowledge themselves as human beings. For this reason, the evangelist adds the words, <clears throat> the men, the shepherds, etc., for faith teaches immediately that whatever is human is nothing in the sight of God. For this reason, they despise themselves to be nothing. And this is true and real humility and self-knowledgement, self-knowledge. Humility means that they are not interested in all those things which are high and mighty in the world and that they associate with lowly, poor, despised people, as St. Paul teaches and says in Romans 12. Do not be haughty, but associate with those who are lowly. So, so this is a Luther pointing out an alternative way to be a human being, not clinging into yourself, not being curved in yourself, but living in openness and humility before God. Further on, this faith persists in both life and death, even as in hell and heaven, and nothing can overthrow it, for it rests on the word alone, word 
it alone without regard to any person. Likewise, Luke says that Mary kept and pondered the words in her heart and that without doubt she was not troubled by the lowly state of the shepherds but considered everything the word of God. <clears throat> so here we, we can see how, how, how Mary poses herself in an excellent position, receiving the word of God, and by this, not despising the, the, the simple shepherds coming to her. And as I earlier quoted, all clung only to the word. That is, open up your arms, stretching up, praying, um, and, and asking for this relationship to one in, in the, in, in the warm-hearted, loving alpha position and cling to that person attached to him. And further on, we are unable to give to God anything in return for his goodness and grace except praise and thanksgiving, which moreover proceeds from the heart and have no greater need of organ music, bells and, and road recitation. Uh, faith teaches such praise and thanksgiving as it is written concerning the shepherds that they returned to the flock with praise and thanksgiving and were well satisfied even though, though they did not become wealthier, were not rewarded high honors, did not eat and drink better. So this is the other side of, of Epsilon position. It's not only praying, coming and being hungry and empty, it's also when you have been given to, to lift up your hands in praise and thanksgiving. And further on, the shepherds, they found Mary and Joseph and the babe in the manger, mentioning Mary before Joseph and both of them before the infant. As we said above, Mary is the Christian church and Joseph the servant of the church. And this is exactly what the position of the bishops and the priests should be when they preach the gospel. That is, we, we should be uh, in an excellent position in listening to the church's uh, re reception of the word of God. Mm. Luther is describing Mary as the church as whole that has been given, given the word of God and reflects on it. And, 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 and from, from that church, uh, in, in terms of the creeds and, and, and in uh, terms of, of, um, of the paradoxes, uh, the, the priests should listen to the creed of the church. The Christian church, the Christian church, on the other hand, keeps all the words of God in her heart and ponders them, compares one with the other and with the Holy Scripture. Therefore, he who wants to find Christ must first find the church. How would one know Christ and faith in him if one did not know where they are who believes in him. He who would know uh, something concerning Christ must neither trust in himself nor build his bridge into heaven, but by means of his, uh, in heaven by means of his own reason. But he should go to the church, he should attend it and ask his questions there. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I, um, I skipped to, to, this, um, to this last quotation here. <clears throat> they could have said it briefly in, the, in this fashion. Therefore, let us see the deed that God has done there. But the, the joy of the Spirit flows over, as it were, with happy words, and yet there is no such said, indeed, all too little, they are unable to say it as much as they really would like to, as Psalm 45 reads. My heart gulps forth of good word, as if the psalmist wanted to say, I should say it right out, but I cannot. It is greater than I can express, so that my word is scarcely more than a gulp. That accounts for the expression found in Psalm 50, that is really 35. And in several other places, my tongue shall gulp forth your righteousness. It, has, it, has, it will talk, sing, and speak while I jump for joy. 
And Psalm 119 says, My lips will gush forth your praise just as a boiling pot seeps and gushes. Now, uh, th these were examples of, of how Luther, in his sermons, gave us wonderful descriptions of these different uh, positions in a structure of authority, and that where authority comes much closer to what the, the, the psychologists of attachment have discovered, rather than the negative uh, Marxist understanding of authority. But you could give Marx that, that what he has discovered would be the beta kind of authority. Now, I would also point out how Luther um, exhorts his authority when he preaches. Uh, how you can, through his written sermons, can get a notion of the authority he exhorted uh, towards his parishioners. <clears throat> First, you can see that Luther openly takes an epsilon position in the relationship of the word, to the word of God. He constantly points out that he is just, you know, um, um, a, a disciple in relationship to the word of God. And it's the authority of the word of God and not his own authority he preaches with. <clears throat> but he, he also poses himself in kind of a cognitive alpha position by, by also preaching as a scholar. He, 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 he leads the, the parishioners into his study, pointing out how he works with the text and, and with the, with, with, with the um, original languages and so on. And so so he, he gives them a trust that this is a man who knew something, he, who studied and, 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 and had something to say. <clears throat> but he, he also preaches with such a compassion that they would find in him, in him a leader who is warm-hearted and really reaches out verbally in describing everyday life and having a compassion with the poor and the small and, and, and the suppressed people. And, and that would, I sure, invite his, his listeners, his parishioners, to, to see this is someone who wants me well, who has a good wish for me and worthwhile listening to. And he also... He, he, he also um, mm, mm, uh, evokes a smile from, from his audience by coming with small jests and, and like this quotation about the, the pot um, that seats and gushes. And he has also in his Christmas sermon one example of, uh, he speaks about the, the diapers that Christ wrapped in and he takes that as an image of the word of God. I mean, that, that is rather... but the inside would be very, very soft. So the outer shape of the Word of God can be hard for our reason to, to understand and, and it's a challenge, but when we come in faith to the inside of it, it will be so, too, so soft and so comfort. Uh, yes. <clears throat> and, and another of these uh, funny images would be that, Luther says, I don't know what they actually wrapped the child in. There is a church in where they say they have as a relic the pants of Joseph that he took off to, 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 to make diapers of to the Christ. I don't know about that, but, but this is, of course, a technique to, to create attachment between the, the, the preacher and the parishioners by smiling. You know, the, the, the deep psychological message of a smile is to say, I accept you in my presence. I feel good having you close to me, therefore I smile. I don't feel threatened by you. And also, um, 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 Luther constantly is using language of relationships, from family relationship and other uh, areas, that would, uh, we could call attachment language, uh, and, and that people would recognize. Now, I would finally come to some conclusions for the church today. 
on the threshold of the next demi-millennium after Reformation. In these latter days of lawlessness and of dysfunctional leadership, the end of peer attachment, I would add, the church need to preach the Alpha of Christ. And by doing this, I'm totally convinced that we would serve humankind that really are like sheep without shepherds. We should not only feel threatened by the secularized societies we live in, but they, because it's not we who suffer the most as more and more persecuted Christians. They are really suffering because they, they, they have lost all safe attachments. The, epistemolo the epistemological issue to the authority of the Holy Scriptures has to be understood as related to the matter of God wanting mankind to attach to him. It's not only a theoretical, philosophical question, it's a matter of relationship that, that, that can be created to the word of God. And we need to point out that. And, and even in, 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 when we meet our other Protestant cousins, <laughs> pointing out you know, very strictly about the, 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 the word of God and, and its authority, we have to be mindful about the, the, the inner side of the scripture. The, the aim is to build up this relationship. The church is called to, by the life and strength of the Holy Spirit, to realize in congregations and in families the alpha epsilon relationship. I think this is, this is dis, um, decisive for, 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 for the progress of our, of our congregations in, in this time, that, that we not only speak about that, but, but in our relationship uh, also gives examples of how we live out in this kind of relationship. And even this, um, you know, in Ephesians, uh, Paul speaks about the subjection of, of wives to their husbands, but even husbands to their wives. So, so you could translate that into attachment. So, so in matrimony, for example, the, the alpha position should be interchangeable. That in some situation, the wife should take the alpha position uh, taking kind of a leadership, comforting or, or whatever, or sometimes rebuking the husband, and in other situations, the, the, the husband need to take that position. Um, but, but we have to remind us that equality, as a political principle from the French Revolution, doesn't work in relationships. <clears throat> Generations of peer-attached adults and children will find healing when they meet Christ as Alpha and attached to him in an Ypsilon position. This is also extremely important that we help the healing of our fellow men finding the, that there is someone caring for you so you don't need to be that cool, you don't, don't need to be that tough because there is a love that will embrace you. Sanctification is imitation of the Savior you attach to. I pointed out that in, in, in relationship to the third use of the law. Preachers need to develop their dancing skills as Luther did, to dance the dance of attachment in terms of also being charming. You know, it's written by Christ as a child after coming back home as 12 year from Jerusalem, that he grow uh, and he was obedient and grew in appreciation. He was appreciated by, by all. And, and, and that word could be, be translated, he was charming for everyone, you know, talking to their hearts. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you for uh, cutting short your coffee and klatschen and coming back uh, so that we can uh, give some time to our next presenters. I've got to know Father Timothy Scott very well over the course of the years in our dialogue. Um, he's a fine musician. We've come in and talked about our organ quite a few times. Uh, but rather than uh, extending uh, uh, the introductions uh, with any stories, I'm just going to read you his biography, and then he has a brief response to the paper we've just heard. There'll be a few moments for questions after that. Uh, Timothy Scott is a member of the Congregation of St. Basil, a Roman Catholic order specializing in education. Born in Regina, he did his undergraduate studies at the University of Saskatchewan. We shouldn't have any trouble with accents this time. After entering the Basilian Fathers, his training for the priesthood took him to the Toronto School of Theology and the Faculté Catholique in Lyon, France. He holds a master's degree in French literature from McGill University, a licentiate in sacred scripture from the Pontifical Biblical Institute, and a doctorate in biblical theology from the Gregorian University in Rome. In 1998, Father Scott was appointed president of St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta, where he ministered until 2011. From 2010 to 2014, he served on the Basilian Fathers General Council in Toronto. He is a member of the National Roman Catholic Lutheran Church Canada Dialogue, and in 2015 was appointed Executive Director of the Canadian Religious Conference, which represents over 13,000 women and men belonging to religious orders in Canada. Thank you for um, representing the dialogue and being part of the Reformation celebrations today, Father Scott. Thank you, Tom. You get called about wolves. Air, uh, Radio Canada calls me about Friday the 13th. They want to know what the Catholic Church's view is on Friday the 13th. They <laughs> never quite know what to say. In uh, the year 1152, Cardinal Breakspear visited uh, Sweden. He was subsequently elected Pope Adrian IV. And now, uh, scant 865 years later, we now have uh, uh, Andreas Arbeletis has been named a cardinal in the Catholic Church in Sweden. And so it was wonderful to hear the talk this morning and last night to be able to speak a little bit about the work of Christian unity that is going on in Sweden. Uh, Pope Francis has a great concern for what he calls the church in the periphery, in these places in the world where Christianity is very much in a minority, whether because the predominant religion is uh, some other religion or because of secularity. And so uh, we Christians, whether it's where I live in Quebec or indeed in Sweden, are uh, few. And it is vital to the ministry of the church that we find ways to collaborate so that the gospel uh, may be proclaimed. I have uh, some written comments on, uh, on uh, more on Luther's Christmas sermon and so my own reactions to that text. But in listening to the presentation this morning, which was, Dr. Zedenfall was really fascinating for me, it brought to mind some earlier work that I had done that frankly hadn't occurred to me, hadn't occurred to me until I was listening today, this notion of authority and how it gets exercised. Those of us who are Canadians, if we compare um, the current Prime Minister of Canada and his father, Pierre Trudeau, I think, uh, Justin Trudeau's fascination with selfies, you know, is sort of a, a kind of, to me, is the clearest example of the sort of peer notion of type. It's what he's constantly working at, isn't it? Right? We're all the kind of the same. We're all in this together. His father had a rather different approach to the exercise of authority. Clearly, Pierre Trudeau was a man of, of hierarchy. He, when he walked into the room, he always knew he was the smartest person there, and he made it very clear to you 
that that was the situation. So we can, we can see even in our own political culture how those realities uh, get expressed. The other thing that came to mind for me was I taught at the University of Alberta, I taught a course in religious education. And we were particularly interested in, uh, there was a book by James Fowler called Stages of Faith. And it was based on Piaget and Lawrence Kohlberg's work on stages of moral development. That children change in the way, as they develop. Uh, for example, when they're very young, utterly, obviously, they're much more dependent upon their parents. But as they become older, particularly as they head into the teenage years, these uh, horizontal relationships, peer-based relationships, become much more uh, significant. It's what uh, Fowler termed the syn synthetic, synthetic conventional faith. And I, basically, Fowler's point of view, and I'm sure it's one that's shared by, by all Christian denominations, is you have to come up with peer-based activities for teenagers in order to get them to uh, kind of experience their faith, you know, youth groups, etc. That, that the kind of authoritative model that is typical, that would work with very young children, breaks down as they head into their teenage years. Their, their notion of rebellion against authority is kind of a typical reality amongst, amongst young people and teenagers. And so how can we as religious educators find ways to use this horizontal, peer-based reality as a means for their evangelization? Anyway, so I thought at least it would be interesting to put uh, Fowler's work on faith development against the presentation that we heard today, just to see how the, the the, fr the reality that young people live today could indeed uh, serve as a means to, to uh, have their faith grow. I'm now going to turn to my comments. Uh, and So this is a little more formal. I would like to thank uh, Reverend Dr. Winger for his kind invitation to respond to the presentation by Reverend Zietenbaugh. I can think of no better way to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation but by a shared reflection on the Word of God and how its very dynamic draws us into a deeper communion of mind and heart. Our presenter has wisely argued for the importance of a hierarchical rather than a peer-based model of learning currently in vogue in some countries in the West. Based on this insight, he retrieves from Dr. Ruth Luther's Christmas sermon the biblical foundations and ecclesial implications for this thesis. As we might expect, the sermon emphasizes the supreme and immediate authority of the Word of God, acting as the ground for the existence and ministry of the church. This topic has allowed me to examine in some detail Martin Luther's Christmas sermon. The Lutheran and Roman Catholic communities hear this particular gospel text, Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 20, at a Christmas morning service. A service we referred to in, in the past quite reasonably as the Shepherd's Mass. Based on the example of the shepherds, Dr. Luther sets out nine signs that the Word of God is indeed present and effective in our hearts. They are faith, single-mindedness of the spirit, humility, love of one's neighbor coupled with the denial of self, joy, being moved to action, public proclamation, Christian liberty, and finally praise and thanksgiving to God. In first place is of course faith, specifically believing in the word, or the message, as opposed to placing one's faith in the messenger. Believing in the message gives life. Believing in the messenger is what Luther terms human faith. And rather like the good seed falling on rocky soil, this human faith is bound to fail. Dr. Luther suggests one can honor the preacher on account of the word he proclaims, but cannot elevate the preacher 
above the word. For me as a Catholic theologian, this particular point resonates with a rather important discussion from the Second Vatican Council on the, on the centrality of the word. At first glance, to privilege the message over the messenger is, is suggestive of something that formerly in the Roman Catholic Church we termed ex opere operato with regard to the sacraments, a term that Dr. Luther rather disliked. Presented, however, in its best light, this doctrine suggested that the efficacy of the sacraments is in no way linked to the skills or even virtues of the minister. It is Christ, rather, the true minister who himself acts despite the obvious weaknesses and sins of his instrument, the human minister, to affect his will in the hearts and minds of his followers. Can a similar analogy be used with regard to preaching and the preacher? Specifically, what is the role of human gifts in the right preaching of the word of God? St. Paul reminds us that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There is obviously a human tendency to prefer listening to a gifted preacher. From Luther in his own century to John Henry Newman and the Wesley brothers in the 19th century to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Billy Graham and Fulton Sheehan in the 20th century, in our human realities, we are attracted to the gifts of the preacher. We are also painfully aware of the harm that a gifted preacher can do in proclaiming another gospel, or worse, engaging in a moral conduct from his place of privilege, the wolf in sheep's clothing. The gospel text that Dr. Luther comments on has a deep sacramental dimension. In the words of the evangelist, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the angels said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. In St. Luke's gospel, the shepherds see the word made flesh and hear the angelic proclamation. Pope Benedict reminded us of this sacramental reality in his 2010 exhortation, Verbum Domini. Allow me to quote it here. The proclamation of God's word at a celebration entails an acknowledgement that Christ himself is present, that he speaks to us, and that he wishes to be heard. St. Jerome speaks of the way we ought to approach both the Eucharist and the word of God. We are reading the sacred scriptures. For me, the gospel is the body of Christ. For me, the holy scriptures are his teaching. And when he says, whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, even though these words can also be understood of the Eucharistic ministry, Christ's body and blood are really the word of scripture, God's teaching. Close quotation. What do we expect of the preacher? In the first instance, Pope Benedict also indicates the importance of the preacher being himself a faithful listener to God's word. Quotation. The preacher should be the first to hear the word of God which he proclaims. Since, as St. Augustine says, he is undoubtedly barren who preaches outwardly the word of God without hearing it inwardly, close quotation. And the final word from Pope Benedict, the faithful should be able to perceive clearly that the preacher has a compelling desire to present Christ who must stand at the center of every homily. A reflection on the gifts of the preacher and the gift of the word inevitably bring to mind the urgent need 
for missionary outreach. As St. Paul tells us, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Pope Francis has spoken of this essential need to proclaim God's word. And I quote, there are places where the word of God has not yet been proclaimed, or although proclaimed, has not been received as the word of salvation. There are places where the word of God is emptied of its authority. We must ensure that the habitual activities of all Christian communities in parishes, associations, and movements truly have at heart the personal encounter with Christ communicated to us in his word, since, as St. Jerome teaches, ignorance of the scripture is ignorance of Christ. Close quotation. As communities of faith under the authority of Christ, we are obliged to preach the gospel to the best of our limited human abilities. We continue the ministry of the shepherds from the Christian gospel. And they returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. As their humble abilities were taken up in the word, so we pray that Christ will use our humble abilities to move the hearts and minds of listeners. And may the fearless and joyful proclamation of God's word be to his glory and to the furtherance of his kingdom. Amen. <laughs>